on behalf of Gandhi Study Circle, uh, Zakir Hussain Delhi College, uh, I welcome you all uh, at the seventh edition of the Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. Uh, the idea of this uh, lecture series uh, has been introduced uh, with the objective uh, to deliberate uh, on the Gandhi's uh, legacy of uh, inclusiveness uh, that underlines uh, Gandhi's philosophy. Uh, since its inception last year uh, on October 2. This meeting is being recorded. Six eminent international scholars, uh, Professor Akhil Bilgrami, uh, Professor Fazal Devji, uh, Professor Vikku Parekh, uh, Professor Dennis Dalton, uh, Professor Ajay Skaria, and Professor Karuna Mantena uh, have contributed to this important lecture series uh, reflecting on Gandhi's uh, life and legacy. Uh, today, uh, as we observe the Martyrs' Day uh, and remember our father of nation, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, we are truly honored uh, to have Professor Aishwari Kumar, Aishwari Kumar, one of the finest scholars uh, of the contemporary period, uh, to be sharing his uh, thoughts uh, today with us. Uh, before we start uh, the proceedings, uh, I bring you a brief uh, snippet uh, of our modest uh, journey. May I ask the technical team to please play the video? Thank you. Uh, that, that was a brief glimpse of our journey. Uh, uh, it is my privilege uh, and honor uh, to welcome uh, Professor Aishwari Kumar, uh, who is a well-known political theorist uh, and intellectual historian uh, working on South Asia, uh, the British Empire, uh, and the Global South. Uh, he did his uh, doctoral uh, work at Cambridge and has been teaching at Stanford uh, for the last 14 years. Uh, his work engages a wide spectrum of issues in modern political philosophy, uh, history of political thoughts and equality, inequality, uh, political freedom and justice, uh, and global uh, lineages of self-determination, uh, citizenship, uh, and rights. Uh, I must mention, uh, <laughs> Professor Kumar uh, is amongst few scholars uh, who engages both Gandhi and Ambedkar uh, often considered to be the adversaries 
uh, but his work uh, brings the tensions and the complementarity in both. Uh, in a way, uh, few have done it uh, before. Uh, his amazing and incredible book, uh, Radical Equality, Ambedkar, uh, Gandhi, and the Risk of Democracy, uh, which was published by Stanford, uh, is amongst the best sellers. And I suggest all uh, <coughs> who have an interest in moral and political <laughs> philosophy uh, must read this book. Uh, before I invite uh, Professor Kumar uh, to speak, uh, may I ask all the participants uh, to kindly uh, keep your audios off uh, uh, during the conduct uh, of the proceedings. After the presentation, uh, we'll <clears throat> have a brief interaction, uh, interactive session, uh, uh, which will be moderated uh, by our friend Aditya Sharma. Uh, uh, today, uh, Professor Kumar uh, has chosen uh, to speak on a very important theme uh, on moral cruelty, uh, Gandhi, uh, dignity, and resentment. Uh, uh, not taking much of the time, uh, may I now request uh, Professor Kumar uh, uh, to deliver his uh, keynote address. Professor Kumar, uh, welcome to Zakir Hussain College, uh, Delhi University. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sanjeev. That's, uh... That's truly uh, heartwarming and extremely generous uh, introduction to my work. Uh, I think uh, it's it's the kind of introduction I don't actually deserve, but but that's that's your uh, that's the mark of your hospitality. I'm grateful. I'm also perhaps even more grateful uh, um, that you've given me this opportunity to speak to this amazing. Uh, spectrum of young students in India right now. Uh, one of the key running philosophical themes, even in Gandhi, especially in Gandhi, is actually the question of Eunice. Um, in Hinsuraj, where he first defines dignity, uh, he defines it as uh, and attaches dignity, the idea of political dignity, to our uh, ability to bring something new in the world something that did not exist before. Uh, I am therefore um, glad uh, and I'm grateful that uh, the Gandhi Study Circle uh, has given me this opportunity to speak to young minds, many of whom uh, often write to me and uh, it, uh, I always learn from all of you. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable privilege. The theme I chose once we, uh, got down to discussing and finalizing this state uh, was, uh, of course, about uh, and revolving around uh, Gandhi's assassination uh, in the winter of, of 1948 uh, by a clique of uh, um, extremely outraged, resentful uh, uh, Brahmin fanatics. But what is also important about today is that it happens to be Rohit Vemula's birthday. Uh, this is the day when Rohit Vemula, who uh, dreamed of thinking with freedom again, one day breaking through the discriminatory universe uh, in which our institutions are trapped, um, was born. And I want to um, uh, begin by invoking Rohit's memory. Uh, students in Hyderabad uh, told me when I was speaking at Valivara there after his death, uh, that he used to read Radical Equality. Uh, there were pages in it that he used to read. Uh, I just want to begin by uh, invoking Rohit's memory um, because that's the kind of courage and more importantly, that's the kind of dignity that we need to return uh, to our political culture, to our political life. Uh, and most importantly, um, for all of us here who do political theory and political science and uh, an ide history of ideas, political thought. Uh, and what I want to do in this lecture simply is make a central argument. Um, and then uh, weave some of the related ideas that flow from, flow from that argument um, and open this to discussion. Uh, I, I think the, the concepts we speak of here are, are difficult. They are not easy, not because we cannot define them. All concepts by their definition are definable, but because these concepts 
when they take on a political life, become very, very ambiguous. Um, dignity, I want us to think through this, these, this triplet of, of concepts, cruelty, dignity, and resentment together, because in their moral structure, there is something extremely pernicious and difficult that connects them. Gandhi's audacity, Gandhi's bravery, Gandhi's courage lay in the fact that he could see the connections and the ambiguous tensions that runs through these concepts. He was right in one way, that if we fail to resolve these tensions, especially the tension between dignity and resentment, we will not only continue to be, but we will further degenerate into a society that thinks that cruelty is a bearable condition of life, that we can live with it. The question I want to end with um, is asking us to think whether Gandhi himself tore through that contradiction. Was he able to surmount this contradiction of which he spoke and of which he speaks from a very young age, in, from his 40s, especially as we know, Hind Swaraj uh, remains his uh, only properly systematic treatise. Um, I want to begin there, of course, with Hind Swaraj. Um, I've already begun there, begun there uh, by invoking his definition of dignity uh, that he articulates in Hind Swaraj. It, it is interesting that dignity comes up in Hind Swaraj only once. Um, and we will have to very carefully pursue the absence of that word in Hind Swaraj and the ways, the modalities of its appearance throughout Gandhi's um, corpus as it develops and builds up over the next four decades until his assassination. So here is my, um, here is a, a thought that I want to share with everyone today, uh, considering uh, that Rohit was born today and he, uh, he was died, he died, he was, I say he was institutionally murdered, uh, just shy of his uh, 27th birthday in, on 17 Jan. Um, what I want to pose as a philosophical problem is this, that often when we talk about moral kinds and moral manifestations of violence, um, we tend to confuse resentment with anger. And these are two different things. Resentment and anger are not only two different things, on our ability to separate and parse them out, to extract one from the other, on that ability and on that success perhaps lies the very question and the very possibility of our democratic survival. That's the thought I want to put. Why are they two different things and why do we often confuse them? Anger can be an extremely ambiguous concept. Nobody thinks about anger more than, as we know, as you all know, as part of the Gandhi study circle, than Gandhi. He thinks a lot about anger. He thinks a lot, lot about calming of passions. Uh, he thinks of nonviolence itself as a triumph over anger. He thinks even courage as a triumph of anger. Now, part of why one can, anyone can, but especially someone as acute and as perceptive as Gandhi can focus on anger is because anger has its own language. We often say anger has a body language. Colloquially, when we discuss anger, when someone rushes out, uh, bangs the door um, and so on. Um, Gandhi's example would be someone slaps your face uh, and he was extremely powerful in the use of these metaphors, uh, rather ordinary metaphors. But what he wants to uh, suggest is that anger has a language, a linguistic code as it were. What I want to suggest is it's precisely because anger has a linguistic code that it, that it becomes more susceptible to or even more inviting to, towards our philosophical and moral questioning. We can be critical, that is to say, we can critique anger, 
because its manifestations, its linguistic codes, the way it expresses itself, especially in political life, in public life, can be deciphered with much greater ease than any other extreme emotion. This is why uh, liberals tend to critique people like Ambedkar, Franz Fanon, and so on, because something in their language gives a, a radiates an aura of philosophical anger, but I want to stress that also an epistemic anger, an anger about the inability to speak in a language that it that will cut through the silence of our voluntary servitude. That's what we discern as anger. Anger, I think, is morally necessary for democratic politics. It is an important function, in fact, of the active citizen to express resistance in forms that can sometimes deviate from the liberal deliberative model. The revolutionary tradition, even the constitutional tradition depends, many of us remember uh, Ambedkar's 1950 frustration and argument that um, I'm willing to burn this constitution. They say I wrote it but I am willing to burn this constitution because sometimes constitutions become instruments to suppress us. Because sometimes democratic degeneration and even tyranny, let alone our unfreedom, tyranny itself will come in the guise of constitutional propriety. And that day I will be the first to burn it. Now here is an expression of a remarkably philosophically dense expression of political and moral anger. That is the anger that Naturam Gurdse lacks. What Naturam Gurdse has in place of this moral anger is what we will call today a political resentment. Why is resentment so difficult as opposed to anger? Remember when, um, when uh, Nehru gives his, reads his, uh, and then of course it's published later on, his obituary for Ambedkar in 1956 as Ambedkar passes away. One of the key words in that very brief obituary from Nehru on Ambedkar is that we all respect Dr. Ambedkar, but we were all always struck by his, this is Nehru's word, reactive demeanor. For Nehru, as for an entire pantheon of nationalists, which a pantheon in which I will not include Gandhi, because Gandhi is way more sophisticated than this pantheon that imagines itself as Gandhi's heir. We need to separate Gandhi also from his heirs. But for this nationalist tradition, Ambedkar has what we can call following Nehru, a reactive demeanor. Now, whatever else we might say of this particular word within that obituary or what I call in radical equality and Sanjeev you would know is an anti-obituary. This is a genre in itself the upper caste swipe of a Dalit genius that masquerades as generosity. So in this one word lies an entire epic of nationalist response to Ambedkar. And this is my claim, this response is not just a nationalist response, is the nationalist resentment of Ambedkar. Now the question for us is, how do we let this resentment pass? Why does resentment itself, despite the many uses we make of this word in public life, often colloquially, often loosely, for different kinds of things, why is resentment so difficult 
to place in our moral and political universe, in our moral and political epistemology. That is because, and I was saying Ambedkar's anger is not just different, it belongs to an entirely different moral order than Nehru's resentment towards Ambedkar. But what I want to say is that resentment itself differs philosophically and conceptually from anger in one particular and decisive way. Our resentment does not have its own language. Resentment takes on or insinuates itself into the dominant procedural and even normative language that we have come to assume is politically neutral, perhaps even morally just. It is only when we assume that liberal democracy depends on norms that are morally and politically neutral that we open the gates for resentment, political resentment to insinuate itself into our normative language. In Annihilation of Caste in 1936, it is this insinuation of resentment as norm that Ambedkar calls India's armed neutrality. We are armed, we just don't see it. We are willing to kill, we just do not accept it. We are ready for combat. We will never concede it. Why? Not because he says Hindus are by their nature evil. Never. Ambedkar never makes that insinuation. What he says is Hindus have a lack of freedom to use their reason. He asks that. In fact, he's not making that claim outright. Those of us who have read Annihilation of Caste closely will remember that sentence where he says, but is the Hindu free to use his reason? Question mark. That's the freedom that Rohit speaks of in his final letter, a freedom freed of resentment. His last afternote, not even footnote, not the main text, the afternote of his letter says, let my decision and action not be put as a responsibility of either my friends or enemies. Nobody bears responsibility. It's, a, it's that sort of courage without resentment that goes away in silence. Resentment is difficult for us to grasp because rather than taking a on its own philosophical or even physical language or what analytic philosophers among us will call a physical reflex that anger can generate, resentment is calm, it's steady, it's simmering. It is simmering because it depends on a sort of concentration. If anger is a sort of moral intensity, resentment is a sort of moral concentration. A moral concentration of what? And this is where nobody thinks more about this than Gandhi. A moral concentration of self. So with that, we can define resentment as the concentration of the self to the extreme limit where nothing but only the injury to myself matters to me anymore. Remember, this is Gandhi's way out of this danger is voluntary disposition, what he used to call uh, voluntary poverty, aparigriha. Gandhi knew that any politics of self that is concerned so fundamentally with self-mastery comes up against a certain kind of, in fact, a very dangerous kind of moral limit. That's why he writes so much about Mariada, about discipline, about that limit we should never, about that line 
we should never cross. It's not important, the political philosopher Judith Schler writes, it is not important that we always know where this line is. It is important, however, that there be a line and that we under no circumstances, she's talking to her fellow liberals, that we under no circumstances ever forget about that line. For Gandhi, that line, that threshold where self-mastery lapses into a political resentment is Mariada. The constellation of practices around this limit, what I would like to call a limit that is geared towards transcending political passion, therefore a transcendentalism of limits, an aporia. For Gandhi, that aporia is Mariata Dharma, a set of cognitive, but also disciplinary, physically disciplined practices that allow us to remember where that line is. Godse did not have such a line. And it is this absence of a line that creates the sort of political monstros monstrosity in Godse's own words. We'll come to that in a moment. It creates the kind of monstrosity about which Gandhi warns, right? It's the kind of monstrosity that Rohit talks about when he says, this is how institutions treat us. I'm not resentful, he writes in that letter. I'm not angry, I'm just empty. That's the kind of, that's the philosophy of democratic emptiness, which is completely different from the kind of majoritarian resentment that Godse embodies. And what I want to, what I posed as a question in the beginning, I want to return to now that part of our democratic degeneration lies in our inability to separate these two. I would even say that liberalism is the philosophy that falters and proves itself repeatedly unable to separate these two. It is not that liberalism does not detest Hindutva. It is not that liberalism does not celebrate Gandhi. It is that liberalism is unable, sometimes willfully unable unwilling to separate these two. Because to liberalism, anger and resentment often look the same. The anger of a Fanon, the anger of a Césaire, the anger of an Ambedkar looks to liberalism the same as the anger of other forms of majoritarian violence. Gandhi returns to us again and again. Students often ask me, what is a classic? Why is Inswaraj a classic? Why is Annihilation of Caste a classic? I mean, that's the case at least I've been making for a while, even in North America. And, and these two books are now more widely taught than they were even a decade ago. These are classics not because we constantly read them. They're classics because every time you return to them, something new appears on their horizon. And it is only after Rohit's letter came into this world that I started to read Hinsuraj for that one word that appears in Hinsuraj just once, dignity. And so in the uh, in the second half of this lecture, I want to simply focus on what happens to dignity when we are careless and callous with it. Where does this word come from? What's the burden? Or um, 
political theorists among us uh, will say, what's the genealogy of this word that has begun to weigh so heavily on our democratic universe itself? Now, the question um, that I posed early on in the context of resentment was whether we can separate it. The question I want to pose now is once we separate it, can we really figure out why we often let resentment pass? Simply because it is silent, simply because it's steadier, sim simply because it has no eruption to it, or there's something more to it. In um, Naturam Godse's um, confessional statement, uh, which is now widely available, it was initially, as we know, uh, bought, banned by the government of India. Uh, well, there are temples to Godse now. Um, in, in, um, in the later edition, in one of the later editions um, of, of that confession, Why I Killed Mahatma Gandhi, uh, there is a part where Gopal Godse, the brother of Nathuram, who publishes this confessional statement as a memoir, uh, has his own account of what happens after the assassination. We know Nathuram is captured, taken to the police station in Parliament Street, held there. And this is the account Gopal Godse gives of that evening where Gopal Godse claims that Devdas Gandhi, Gandhi's eldest son, walks into the Parliament Street police station to look at Nathuram. And Nathuram tells Devdas Gandhi, apparently, we are told, you must have come here thinking I'm a bloodthirsty monster. But will you listen to me for a few seconds, for a few minutes? I have nothing, I have nothing personal. But the murder of your father was an act that was purely political and political alone. End quote. Purely political. Now, what is interesting is there are many ways to read this. But in the context of the delusion and the fantasy of ascetic self-sacrifice in which Godse has brought himself up, he thinks that claiming something with that brutal honesty is a mark of his dignity. That he is doing a certain kind of, he's justifying that entire tradition, in his case, the Hindutva majoritarian tradition, by giving this politics a face, a politics of honesty even, because that's the way he, he Gopal Godse tells us in this highly dramatic and absolutely untenable account of an encounter, that you thought I was a monster, but actually I'm not. And this is a remarkable and dramatic staging of something way more, let, let it, I mean, even if we move beyond the veracity of this account, there's something way more pernicious that hides in plain sight. It hides in plain sight because resentment often hides in plain sight as dignity. So this is what resentment and dignity therefore share. Resentment and dignity share a language of monastic self-dissolution. They both take a certain pleasure for the lack of a better word here. It, can, it may not be pleasurable at all times but they both are equally attached 
to certain notions of the self in which nothing else other than the purported alleged injuries to the self begin to matter. An intensification of the self we proposed is anger. And I call it intensification because that anger is, is, is something that is that, that acquires its form in response to and on behalf of a collective. Anger is important to revolutionary or militant and most centrally democratic action. Without anger, without what Ambedkar calls frustration, even exasperation, that the world simply is stuck in the old. Without the anger that we need something new, think in Swaraj here again, that brilliant formula, that to believe, Gandhi says, to believe that what has not happened in history will not happen, is to argue for a disbelief in the dignity of man, end quote. If we were simply willing to live with the dead wood of history, completely passive, even unangry, nothing might change. Democracy needs moral anger. Tyranny feeds on a resentment that morphs into moral cruelty. What is moral cruelty other than that condition where we begin to find tyranny bearable? We begin to start live, we, we, we begin to live with it. Right? It is important to make this distinction. It is important to follow some of these very fine threads that Gandhi walks, needles, precisely because on this, on our ability to distinguish between anger on the one hand, a moral anger on the one hand, and a resentment that morphs into moral cruelty on the other will depend the future of our democratic culture. And part of our challenge is to understand that resentment does not come from those who are oppressed. Resentment does not come from people who mobilize for affirmative action. Resentment comes from those people who are so concerned about their classical notions and histories of dignity that they are willing to burn themselves for it. What is remarkable, for example, about the 1989 Mandal agitation was that the accusation was that it was the lower caste who were resentful of Brandon's. Gandhi himself writes about Ambedkar that Ambedkar says, I want to be as high as Brahmin, even if I have to destroy myself and the Brahmin in the process. Nothing of that sort happened. Rohit did not kill a Brahmin, nor did Ambedkar. But that's the sort of fascination with height. What is caste? other than our obsession with height, one that mistakes distance for dignity. And that dignity, unless we remember the line, Gandhi's Mariyadu, has all the possibility and the potential to morph into a kind of resentment 
whose effects we cannot even fully discern, whose political ramifications we cannot even comprehend, whose destructive capacities we cannot even measure. Dignity assumes a normative conception of the self. That's one way, right? That's one way to understand dignity in, in the history of political thought. It's the idea attached to moral worth of a person. Without dignity, our commitment to personhood means nothing. Think of, um, on a global scale, think of um, the Geneva Convention. Think of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the single most translated document in human history. Dignity appears right there. There is no other document in human history which is translated into as many languages as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Without dignity, without our commitment to it, there will be no personhood and therefore no rights. That's one history of dignity. And the other history of dignity is a dignity that comes from sovereignty. It's the dignity that comes from height, from majesty, from lineage, from blood. Right? The, the difference between anger and resentment is that resentment feeds on a memory of that sovereignty. That it is, it simply cannot be that resentment is just an attribute of the oppressed. It's just not possible. Resentment is the attribute of the masters. We have convinced ourselves, and this is true not only of India, this is true of the leading liberal democracies in the world today. That the oppressed are resentful. That the working class is resentful. But actually that's not where the resentment is. That's not conceptually where resentment can come from and that is not where politically resentment is coming from. Resentment attaches itself only to the language of the masters and simmers. It is a kind of concentration of privilege that wants to curb the history of rights, the flow of rights. And before I um, open this to discussion, I will give one, one important moment here that comes after Gandhi, but which, which perhaps makes Gandhi even more important for us. As we all know, other than dignity, the, the most classical idiom of Gandhian political thought is the, is, the, is the place that he assigns to virtue. Virtue takes many forms and many names in Gandhi's writings, but what is really at work in that thinking is political virtue, civic virtue. And Gandhi pushes it to a point where it becomes important for us to focus more on virtue rather than rights. It is in the 1960s with the civil rights movement in the United States that for the first time that tradition 
that Gandhian tradition, but that, that classical tradition of civic virtue is replaced by a new revolutionary tradition of civil rights. It is with civil rights that nonviolence acquires its most revolutionary form. It acquires its most revolutionary form not by cutting itself out of the debate over rights, but precisely by making rights the center of all thinking about moral limits. What we must therefore now understand is that we need a Gandhi for our times. And the Gandhi we need for our times is not a Gandhi that is steeped in rhetorics of civic virtue, of civic obligation. It's a Gandhi that must be resurrected for a tradition of civil rights. Because the greatest problem for democracies today is not the anger of those who are, as Ambedkar called them, apart apart. The greatest problem for democracy right now is a long accumulated history of resentment of those who have always had power. We need to read Gandhi in light of this very, very important, and I would say um, propose this in light of, when we read him Swaraj again, when we read his lectures on the Gita again, we cannot read Gandhi anymore without keeping this important philosophical distinction, a distinction that sometimes Gandhi fails to keep even though he gives us the philosophical resource to think about this limit, this line between anger and resentment. If the anger of the oppressed looks us in the eye and threatens us, it's because there is a revolutionary, emancipatory, democratic scream in that anger. And if there is someone who is quieter and simmers and doesn't say anything, classic Godse type, that does not mean one must not confuse that simmering silence as civility, because that is resentment looking at us in the eye. That's the resentment that ends democracy. Gandhi brings these two together. Gandhi brings dignity and resentment together. He's unable to fully explore and deconstruct this structure in which dignity and resentment, civility and cruelty, prosper and even thrive together. We should have absolutely no shame in conceding that Gandhi did not have all the answers. Gandhi would like that, I think. Some of the things he just did not see. He did not see how nonviolence can be used and nonviolence can actually conceal the greatest violence only because it does not erupt on our social surface, it's not any less violent. It's simply violence as resentment by other means. What I call moral cruelty as opposed to political cruelty, which is a completely different set of practices. Our moral cruelty lies in this confusion. And it is with this confusion in which we forget that resentment is a trait, an attribute, not of the oppressed, but of the oppressors.
when we forget that is when we become morally cruel. I want to end with one final line about what this cruelty is and how it's different from political cruelty. Political cruelty is the deployment of extreme violence for political effect. Moral cruelty is the destruction of the very idea of personhood. The repeated moral injury on a person to the extent to that limit that that person simply becomes unable to trust either herself or the other. That is what Rohit writes in his final letter as a non-resentful emptiness. If we are not careful, and we are all readers of Gandhi, this is a Gandhi study circle, so I will end with this. If we do not read Hind Suraj in light of our own times, beyond the categories we have inherited, then we will perhaps lose our inability to see the connection between concentrated politics of dignity and deployable political resentment that might end in concentration camps. Calls, of, calls for that have already been made openly now. And on our ability to understand how dignity and resentment feed into one another, how our dignity can make us indifferent, how our silence can prove to be cruel on that ability to see how dignity morphs into resentment lies the future of our democracy in not comprehending that link, that structural connection, that bond between dignity and resentment is perhaps today the greatest risk as I call it in our book, and Sanjeev was very generous uh, in talking about it. In that inability lies the greatest risk to our democracy. And so I'll end there. And I'll be happy to take questions if that's what the format is. Uh, uh, thank you, Aishwarya. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we are all spellbound um, at the reception uh, of your very powerful presentation today. Uh, uh, you have uh, delineated the relationship uh, that resentment has uh, with anger and how this is all linked up with the whole question of dignity. It is fitting uh, that we remember Gandhi today and we don't lose sight of this very fact that how uh, in, the, in, in the context of the questions, the larger questions that we have, uh, the whole idea of moral dignity has replaced, has relapsed into the question of you know, moral cruelty. And this is where I think uh, this lecture is important to us uh, so that we remember uh, at this crucial juncture where not just democracies, you know, the Indian democracy where we stand uh, for, for the larger, you know, construction of idea of moral universe, uh, we need to understand this. I think it was, it was extremely important uh, lecture for all of us. And I think uh, the audience present here uh, certainly would have a lot of questions to you, you know, queries, uh, you know, for this, I request Aditya, uh, you know, uh, to continue with the proceedings uh, and take on the questions. Uh, so may I request Aditya uh, to take this uh, question answers round. Uh, we, we, we may take uh, another 30 minutes, uh, Aishwarya, is it well? 30 to 40 Absolutely. minutes. Yeah. Tonight is very young here in California. Oh, so I'm very thank happy. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. so much. And Aditya is a young scholar, you know, working with us and he will be Great. carrying forward this proceedings. Aditya, speak. Wonderful. 
Great. Thank you so much. I just want to say that I honestly feel at a loss of words right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, the question answer session. So, so uh, we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to not love the ones who are along similar teams together. And one question which emerges you know, repeatedly in Dandian discourse in general, as well as in this question once, is that of you know relevance in a more contemporary sense. And I think a better word for relevance here would be application, in the sense that someone asks, how can we you know, apply the uh, idea of nonviolence in a more contemporary sense? In this sense, for example, the case that they live is of India, Kashmir, and Pakistan, and specifically asked how can you know Indians apply the idea of nonviolence. And you know, did in Kashmir or perhaps lose Kashmir to Pakistan if that brings out peace? And another question about contemporary application would be of moral cruelty, wherein the question uh, the questioner asks if you can give a contemporary example to further elucidate the concept. Right. Yeah, that th those are um so I'll I'll take them in the reverse order because I think conceptually it, it becomes easier to uh club them together. First, I mean uh one one um example which I which I started with and, and I wove the lecture around. One example of that moral cruelty I was talking about was actually, and, and, and today's the day to think about it even more carefully, is, is Rohit's uh, death by suicide. Um, now, if we are right in assuming that moral cruelty is cruelty or extreme violence without the spilling of blood, moral cruelty is violation of personhood rather than destruction of the physical body to the extent that the very idea of human as such comes into crisis. That sort of violence which masquerades as nonviolence, sometimes even as normative choice is moral cruelty. I, um, I was saying that part of why moral cruelty is so now you know this question is important uh, and 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 so let me take a step back um, and and say that part of cruel part of the distinction between violence and cruelty is this when we as citizens look at violence an act of violence we also see possibilities of a nonviolence or nonviolent resistance, and B, counterviolent resistance, right? There are two responses, both moral and political responses, to, let's say, state violence. Um, a, a, ma a deranged man with a country made pistol lets himself loose on quietly protesting unarmed students in the heart of the capital of the most populous democracy in the world. That act is violence. There are responses to that kind of violence. Either young students respond by not moving, which will be a nonviolent resistance, which will be the Gandhian idea of resistance, remember his instructions. And this is why Gandhi was extremely important, uh, quite a brilliant strategist during the Salt March when he says, the one thing I want the Satyagrahis to never do is take help from another Satyagrahi when they have been hit and when they have been fell to the ground, right? So that sort of nonviolent resistance becomes possible in the face of violence. The other form of resistance to violence is counter violence. We see that when um, two groups um, clash, we see that, for example, in the United States, when uh, extremely reactionary white supremacists um, are, you know, marching in violent procession, some Antifa or anti-fascists will come up and slap a white supremacist. That's not that's counter violent resistance, right? Cruelty is different from violence or counter-violence for this and this reason alone. It's the kind, cruelty is the kind, the extremity of violence to which in response, 
no counter violence will ever make it better. It will only worsen the situation. Cruelty is the violence to which there is no resistance. And this is why Rohit's letter is important. When he writes in that letter, I'm not hurt, I'm just empty. I bear no resentment, but I have no hope. That's the example of a moral cruelty made visible. A moral cruelty, an act of moral cruelty is not only something to which we offer no resistance, it's also an act that is ingrained into our habits. Think of what changed after that, right? The idea that we can just simply live under tyranny as if nothing changed is the first inkling that we have come to accept a world in which moral cruelty sometimes passes as civility. So every time we try to think of examples of moral cruelty, we need to remember that it is distinct from violence because sometimes cruelty will not be explicitly violent. Sometimes cruelty will appear in the world as nonviolence or civility, sometimes even snobbery. Judith Schler defines uh, snobbery as our repeated attempts to make somebody's inequality hurt. We didn't, we can say from our institutional spaces and our spaces of moral or uh, institutional authority, we didn't kill Ruth. He killed himself. He was weak and, and the brilliance there lies in Rohit's anticipation of that criticism. And he says in that letter, I know some will think I'm being weak, right? That's moral cruelty when it is the victim who must bear the responsibility for our tyrannical choices. So that's the example I was giving in order to make um, something clear for us that our greatest cruelty does not actually lie in our ability to spill blood our greatest ability lies in our uh, our greatest cruelty lies in our ability to simply look away perhaps even our ability to hesitate to let life perish if uh, some of you have read ambedkar's unfinished fragmentary memoir his abandoned autobiography which he calls waiting for a visa there's an example he gives of an upper caste doctor who goes into a child uh, to, uh, to treat um, a sick woman. He goes in to her house, right? She's dying there and suddenly realizes she's an untouchable. And he says, I can't touch her and she dies. And that fragment in Ambedkar's own autobiography ends there simply with the yeah. sentence, the Hindu would, prefer to be inhuman before he agrees to touch an untouchable. That act of hesitation, that murderous moment is cruel. Right? The, the homicidal impulse that kills the very idea of personhood is cruelty, right? And it takes the form not of spilling of blood, but sometimes pure indifference, our ability to walk away. Okay. Gandhi writes in the, 19, in the 1920s repeatedly, we make our own people crawl on their bellies. We take bats if their shadow falls on us or think of Ambedkar's Mahat Satyagra speech where he says, we are 
barred from drinking water from a tank in which dogs are allowed to drink from. It's not violent. It's simply cruel. because its manifestations offend or today should offend our very sense of humanity. So the examples of cruelty abound, but as we were saying in, 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 the, in, in the case of resentment as well, it is how we discern an act. It is in the method that cruelty appears. It is not in its manifestation, but in its cognitive blockage, in our inability to think when we see cruelty, that cruelty can become difficult to grasp. It's all around us and it's nowhere. Okay. To the first question now about how can we, now this is what nonviolence for today must become. It must, become a project, our nonviolence should become a project of rescuing nonviolence from this cognitive blockage in which we let our difference morph into indifference. Simply because someone is different in this uh, question, for example, there is the question of, of, of Pakistan, there is the question of the Muslim, there's the question of the minority, there's a question of the woman, there's the question of the Dalit. We have let our differences become the excuse for our indifference towards others. Nonviolence will lay in, will lie in our ability to dissolve this limit. Can Kashmir be given away? to Pakistan, sure. I mean, can Kashmir vote? That's the question. For us, the question is not of statecraft. For us, the question is, does it offend us? Does it make us in our, in our, um, in, in the framework that we have been working with this morning, does it make us angry that Kashmiri youth can be tied to a jeep and used as human shields by the army. The question is very simple. These are not metaphysical questions. These are questions of moral psychology, practical things, specific things. You know, every time Gandhi would launch a movement, you talk about very specific, narrow things, limits. Limits are important there philosophically. Uh, theologically even, but also practically for him. In those specific circumstances, are we willing to do something more with our moral anger, which is absolutely necessary to democratic action? Or will we simply simmer away and let it morph into something else into somebody else's hands? That's the question. The question is not about Kashmir. The question is about Kashmiris, in other words. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. At this point, we'll open the floor to questions directly from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Yeah, Priyanchu. Um, hello, sir. Hello, everybody. Uh, um, so my question uh, is related to nonviolence and anger. Um, so do you think Gandhi's idea of nonviolence is a better way so to channelize the anger of the suppressed? Because uh, often we see uh, that uh, the suppose the protests by the uh, suppressed, maybe the farmers that we have had in India very, um, so there was a lot of trial from the huge political spectrum and also uh, the French groups that they tried to make, so to um, 
uh, I would say, uh, in in a sense, it was tried hard by these fringe groups and the political spectrum to delegitimize that protest by uh, puking some se scenes of uh, violence here and there. So, do you think this Gandhi's idea of non-violence uh, that we wanted to embrace in, in a larger sense that was embraced by the protesters was a way to uh, legitimize their anger in a more rational form? Right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 you know, one thing about uh, political nonviolence, and, and this is very, very apparent and very clear because Gandhi, as we all know, spends a lot of time thinking about this. Political nonviolence becomes possible in the face of gravest threat of violence, right? Sometimes political nonviolence involves inviting violence in full view so that a moral response becomes possible in a world racked by indifference. In, in so many ways, um, the Sorak Satyagraha was, a, was one of the great examples of inviting the full coercive apparatus of the colonial state upon the Satyagrahic body, right? So you could argue that political nonviolence works precisely when it is met with absolutely unbridled violence. Uh, Hannah Arendt uh, wrote about Gandhi saying his method could not have succeeded in Nazi Germany. It succeeded only because it, this was India, a liberal empire. Well, there is nothing like a liberal empire, right? In Jallianwala Bagh, there was no liberalism at work. But what Philosophically, she mistakes there, I think, is that Satyagraha was perfected, invented, honed, refined, and put to practice not in a liberal colonial society, but actually in a society so unequal and marked by such racist asymmetry and violence that we had to invent a word for it, apartheid. That is where Satyagraha is born. Okay. So in some ways you could argue with Gandhi here, that is to say, um, take his account of no political nonviolence on board and say it succeeds. Not only does it succeed, nonviolence becomes politically viable precisely in face of the gravest asymmetry of power. And in that sense, I, I'm very glad that uh, you are and you all are thinking about the farmers' protest because that is a great example. That there were efforts made not only to, um, to attack physically, but also to demoralize and demean morally the very idea of civic protest, right? Um, some were linked to Khalistan, others were uh, anti-national so on and so forth. So what, what we see here is a, is a classic example of the different ways in which state power manifests itself. The real question which I see hidden in, in, in the heart of your question is, can nonviolence be as malleable and supple? Can nonviolence be less dogmatic? Can nonviolence appreciate the anger of the oppressed as opposed to always tied to the civic dignity of the masters? The real question at the heart of your question is not whether nonviolence is viable. Of course it is viable. The real question for us is what is the kind of nonviolence? What is the moral to, to, to raise, to bring back Sanjeev's point, what is the moral universe in which a new sort of nonviolence will become possible? What will it take for us to bring political faith back to political nonviolence? And the example is right there in your question. A nonviolence that is 
malleable enough to understand that it does not require classical histories of dignity. Metaphorically, sure. You know, this, the, now you can even argue that uh, Amar Jawan Jyoti was a celebration of some imperial army that uh, farmers from the Punjab were pro Khalistan separate. You can argue as many things as you can, but nonviolence has the capacity to absorb that. without lapsing into the old rhetoric of Kshatriya Dharma, Brahman Dharma, Shudra Dharma, right? Political nonviolence becomes revolutionary when it gives up the archaic language of dignity and takes on the language of the right to act, to bring something new. Is it viable? Of course. For me, your real question is, how do we rethink nonviolence freed from its obviously glorious past? Thank you, sir. I believe we've reached the end of our time that we've exhausted our 30 minutes for this question and answer session. And I would just like to say that this has been one of the most Enlightening. Yeah, maybe if uh, Ashwarya permits, we can have a few more questions because there are a few hands being raised. Uh, so if Ashwarya would allow us, uh, maybe we can take Absolutely. a couple of questions. Yeah, we, we will. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Please take Aditya a few more questions and then we can wind up. Wonderful. So, so now if you would allow me, I have a question of my own that I kind of wanted to ask you in the context of the answer you just gave to Preemptive question, where you talked of political violence, right, and political non-violence. So my question to you is, how do you make a distinction between violence which is political and violence which is non-political? Because to me, it seems like every kind of violence is inherent to political. Political, right? Yeah, yeah. That's 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 very that's very important. And I think I think uh, one thing we need to remember is that often. Uh, Political violence, uh, by its very nature, we, we, we decide to call something political violence when it is designed to produce political effects or worse, bring into the world some political consequence. One example of, one, one very you know, blunt example of political violence uh, would be the killing of election workers and running away with boots. Uh, uh, what's the real, the ballot boxes, right? Now that is a classic liberal democratic example of political violence in which you not only assault and injure and most likely kill someone who's there to carry out the normal, perhaps even the primary duty and obligation of, uh, of, of a democratic society, which is to hold free and fair elections, you not only assault and kill someone, you actually try and alter by use of force the results of a political um, event and election. Right? That's, that, is a, that is a classic example of political violence. Now, what we want to underscore here precisely by using cruelty as our entry point is that cruelty is that violence which uh, cruelty uses extreme violence in order to depoliticize the political realm. That is to say, make resistance impossible. Okay. So one way to understand cruelty is, is that not that it's non-political violence, but it is violence that will destroy the very possibility of politics. When we say political cruelty, this is, this is the paradox in defining something as politically cruel. And, and I'm glad you raised this question because it is a naughty question here. While we call it political cruelty, what is interesting about political cruelty and what is tragic about political cruelty at the same time is that cruelty becomes political precisely when it and highlights the possibility of politics and of resistance, right? And 
absolute destruction of any force that opposes the dominant force. One example of violence tending to political cruelty. Here is an example of violence. Paramilitary armed factions climb up the structure of a 16th century mosque because it reminds them of a medieval defeat and they pull it down, right? That's violence, that's political violence, but its effect is exactly the op opposite. Its effect is to depoliticize over a period of 30 years. Remember, we are in the 30th year of the demolition of the Babri Masjid. It has taken this cycle of violence and counter-violence and repressive violence 30 years to come to a point where now there is nothing there. It has been completely depoliticized, rendered, to use Aditya, your expression, rendered non-political. Hindus will now go to that temple with no awareness what had happened there. Hindus will go to that temple in the pomp that is a Hindu temple, completely oblivious and deliberately forgetful that that is mired in a violent political act. That no prayer you offer in Ayodhya is politically neutral. So political cruelty is precisely that which renders the political, to use your word, renders the political non-political, right? The difference is not in their manifestations. One is not laterally separate from another. The, different is, the difference is not in their sequence. One does not come before the other because this is a cycle. The crucial difference here mm -hmm. is that one is the intensification of the other. One is to use the expression we were using during the lecture, political violence, when it is concentrated to its extreme, can begin to look non-political. I want to leave us there with, with this thought in response to your question, I I mean, I mean, let's sit with that thought a little bit. The real difference or distinction between political and non-political violence is that simply one is the most intense, unbearable, inconsolable form of the other, from which there will be no reprieve. Right. The demolition of a mosque was a political act of political violence. For us to now believe that that sacred ground is new, politically neutral and therefore non-political, that intensification of violence to its depoliticizing extreme would be non-political. Um, Hello. Like... Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sure. uh, when we are talking about uh, nonviolence of Gandhi, it is uh, confined to uh, somehow uh, with the category of self and other. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, can we locate Gandhi's uh, nonviolence or Gandhian nonviolence uh, in statecraft or in, in, in political institutions? how political institutions uh, uh, can conceive the idea of non-violence? Non that is my question. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, can, the, the question really there in the most direct way is can, can states be non-violent? And we are often told, and this is another, uh, another uh, reading of Gandhi that has had an enormous life, enormously influential and powerful life, it, it is expressed uh, uh, in a way more sophisticated fashion than it has been made out to be. But, but Ashish Nandi in the 1980s had made this argument that Gandhi is a philosophical anarchist. Um, 
I, I don't think so. And, and you know, in, in radical equality, I make this point at some length, uh, we cannot understand nonviolence without sovereignty. Um, but, but, but that's a different conversation uh, in, in the sense that sovereignty here is not simply state sovereignty, it's also the sovereignty which begins with the very idea of the self. And Gandhi works, tries to work around that by, as you were very rightly pointing out, by, by the notion that it's, it's first the other and then the self. Um, but, but the real question here is, can we have a world in which we, we have states? We don't have to be a stateless, anarchic world to be nonviolent. I mean, that, that is just an obfuscation of the real question, I, I think, and it has had a very powerful afterlife since the 1980s. Um, you know, for Gandhi, nonviolence or, or satyagraha is first and foremost a, a disposition, right? And one of the things we forget about ahimsa or, 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 or satyagraha is for the, at, at the most irreducible level, and I'm calling it irreducible, not, not casually. That is to say, at, at the level in which you have distilled everything you can and removed every sort of trappings that you can and found this core of Satyagraha. In the end, Satyagraha is a theory of moral conduct and duty. Gandhi is so attached to the idea of moral duty that when he's asked about uh, the Garwali rifles, um, they are deployed to uh, ward off nonviolent protesters. Um, and Gandhi's asked in Europe about the decision of the Garwali Rifles Constabulary, fully armed. And they are asked to open fire on unarmed protesters yet again. Um, and the constabulary, the front line of the armed constabulary refuses to open fire. Gandhi's asked about this moment of civil disobedience when he's in Europe. In fact, in Switzerland, and um, he's asked, "What did you think of that?" And Gandhi says, "I disagree. They should have opened fire. I disagree. They should have opened fire for one and one reason only. For the same reason that Krishna tells Arjun, don't try to act that you are nonviolent today, while you have trained all your life to kill people. This is your weakness speaking, not your ahimsa." The, the, the remarkable, radical turnaround of the modern interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita. Gandhi single-handedly runs away with the Gita from the nationalist's hands, from the likes of Tilak and Savark, right? Here is, it's, and, and this is a question that is uh, animating so many of the other questions that have been asked. Here is the real example of Gandhi, what Gandhi thinks of that theoretical, philosophical moment of the Gita. He says, no, the duty of the soldier is to fight. They should have simply opened fire, right? So at the heart of Satyagraha is not this easy distinction between violence and nonviolence, but a commitment, a rigorous commitment to thinking what your vocation in the world is because that defines your place. Now that takes extremely conservative forms in Gandhi. We do not have to go there. It's already there. We began with Rohit Vamula, so we know what it is. But more important for us is to understand that Satyagraha is not an anarchist form of action. Satyagraha is an extremely sustained, rigorous commitment to duty, to rigor, to discipline. Of course, there are two words that Gandhi uses in, uh, in the 20s and 30s for discipline. At times in the early 20s, you, start, you see he starts using the word mariada, which I think is basically a punitive limit. But the other one is sadhana. Satyagraha is impossible without sadhana. And in that lies Gandhi's real commitment to office, right? If you are an IAS officer, if you are an editor, 
if you are a novelist, if you are a political theorist, if you are a lawyer, the greatest act of nonviolence is to do your duty without violating the dignity of any of one else. And that changes. Satyagraha is in the end a dispositional change. Start with, to start with my own disposition is to start with Satyagraha. And this is essential because even when you read Ambedkar during the Mahat Satyagraha, this is what Ambedkar says uh, before uh, the copy of the manuscript is burnt. He says there are two um, ways to be political. Right? Either we break all laws or we actually first master this text that we are burning. Right? Rigor. Nonviolence is impossible without rigor. He says, you know, we can't, you know, um, to burn the manuscript is easy. But what is really necessary is that we master them. And that's the mastery of a completely different order than the mastery of the masters, the dominant class, the state. Is a nonviolent state possible? Yes but it will not come by changing the state. It will come by changing the people who are that state. Right? We are that state. A people gives itself the capacity and the decision and the, above all the right to rule itself, self-rule. Right? To the classical philosophical question that starts with Aristotle and Plato, can the people rule? We know that Plato says no. The moment you give democracy to the people, it becomes demagoguery. Gandhi has no such condescending things to say about the people. Gandhi believes the people can rule themselves. But it requires the sort of moral psychological transformation that sometimes he is unable to fully imagine. And that is where our work of reading Gandhi again must begin. Thank you, sir. Uh, so at this point, uh, we'll take two up questions on resentment and then the show will come to you. Uh, so firstly, so what do you think, given your definition of resentment or given other Gandhi's definition of resentment, would you consider the emergence of white supremacists, supremacists in the United States and Hindu to a majority in politics in India as resentment? And secondly, is acceptance of truth the truest response to resentment? And if we can relate this idea of you know, acceptance of truth to the Italian's concept of individuation. Uh, can you repeat the second and send the second question? Yes, Just second. yes, yes, yes. So, would the acceptance of truth be the truest resp response to resentment? And if we can relate this concept to Italian's concept of individuation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to the first question, I, I, I think um, I think one of the things we were trying to uh, to say early on is 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 precisely that the um, Resentment is different from anger precisely because resentment is the majoritarian impulse, right? Res resentment is the making majoritarian of democracy. Remember, democracy is based on the principle of the majority decision, not majority rule. When a, when a society or a people or a political community gives itself democracy, when it declares we the people, it gives itself democracy with one and one limited power only that the majority will make the decision. Right? Even there, Gandhi is a skeptic. And this is why Hind Suraj is is at times just 
dramatic in its militancy. Think of that moment in Hind Swaraj where Gandhi says, history will show that the majorities are often wrong and the minorities are right. And that the greatest transformations in history have come from the initiative of the minorities. It's a very powerful idea. Now, it is lost later on. I'm uh, unwilling, as I'm sure all of us are unwilling to look away from the fact that that early radicalism is lost somewhere. Nonetheless, it is present in Hinswaraj that the majority can be and is often wrong. Gandhi is channeling here an entire democratic uh, tradition of skepticism, which says, you know, that it's very arbitrary to believe that the majority is right. I mean, the very idea that one person should get one vote is an abstract normative idea. There is no philosophical foundation for it. In fact, it's so abstract that in the history of political theory, there is no proper explanation as to why the majority decision principle should work or is accepted or perhaps even morally acceptable. And that is the, that is the tradition of skepticism that Gandhi is already, already uh, articulating in Hind Swaraj. So when we, when, when we talk about resentment, this is the question we are bringing back to our analysis of democratic life and democratic mentality, in fact. The idea that the majority is always right is a completely abstract idea. Majorities can often, in fact, be wrong, corrupted by absolute power. And one political manifestation of resentment is precisely this, the making majoritarian of our political trust, by which I mean the majoritarian belief that whatever it says is right because it is the majority's verdict upon which democracy rests. This is why um, Ambedkar says there is no democracy without courage to tell the truth. Because only the courageous, the fearless will tell the truth to the majority that you are wrong. In the 1943 essay, Ranade, Gandhi and Jinnah, Ambedkar's, Ambedkar writes, there was only one secret to freedom. There is, this is not a big idea. There's only one secret to freedom and the secret to freedom is courage. That's it. But not an insulated courage, but a courage of a collective, a truth that is shared. In that sense, truth cannot simply be political truth, cannot be an individual conviction. A political truth is a collective and a fundamental commitment. It is not dependent on personal beliefs. It is dependent on the freedom of others. This is why we were saying that the more we intensify the politics of self or in, in your language, individuation, the more we um, concentrate politics into the art and craft of self-fashioning alone, the less freedom remains about others. And this is why truth, political truth, there's only one political truth, in fact, I think, and that's, that the freedom of others is the only way in which I can secure my freedom. My own freedom will never secure the freedom of others. That's the 
in the United States, that's the Republican claim, philosophically speaking, that it's all about individual freedom, liberty. The democratic claim here is that without the freedom of others, there is no political freedom. And that is the first and the most fundamental political truth. A truth that depends not on my convictions, personal convictions, but on our shared political commitment. Okay. So it is important to, to, to I, I want to return to the first question uh, because what we see in the United States in, in, in white supremacy and what we see in India in, in, uh, in forms of majoritarian implosions is precisely this idea that my injury has always been greater than everyone else's injury. I am so concerned with and so concentrated on self-hurt that I really do not care how many other people I end up hurting. That's resentment, but that is also white supremacy. I will not let others have the freedom that I think belongs only to me, by which I mean that it is embodied only in my physical person, my own body, which is in the United States, the white body, which is the, the dispositive or the apparatus of height, which in India we call Brahmanism, in the Brahman body. Ambedkar has a remarkable moment in Annihilation of Caste where he says, we think, um, we think that we can reform a political and a legal system without addressing caste, but actually try and, try, and re uh, try and reform or try and abolish the death penalty. Because you cannot, and, and this is what he's saying, caste by its very nature, by its very structure, demands and depends on the institution of the death penalty. And this is a remarkably um, startling philosophical claim there. It's just, it's, it's just on, on a global scale, this is one of the first arguments that gives a genealogical critique of why you cannot abolish something as barbaric as the death penalty without you abolish the barbaric social order and racial order upon which these punishments depend and the punishments which entrench these social and moral universes. Jacques Derrida writes this about the death penalty in the United States. Derrida says, to try and abolish the death penalty in the United States without addressing the idea of white supremacy is bound to fail. It's like arguing that slavery has nothing to do with American democracy. A real nonviolence will appear in our horizon when we will stop pretending that caste has nothing to do with our democracy, that Brahminism has nothing to do with our democracy. Now, Ambedkar and Gandhi, I mean, Ambedkar especially will be the first one to say, this does not mean every Brahmin is a criminal. Remember, there will be Brahmin dissenters who will die in prison waiting for trial, <clears throat> uncharged. Some will even be denied reading glasses or insulin. Not all of them are Dalits or Blacks. Some of them could well be Brahmins or Christians. Right? It is not that the Brahmin will not suffer. It is that the structure itself is steeped in a Brahminism that has rendered itself invisible even to the Brahmin. 
this is why the intensification of the self to a point that it becomes a site of resentment poses a risk to democracy. It's first, the only democratic truth for us is that I have no freedom before the freedom of others. I have no freedom in the absence of freedom of others. And there is no greater freedom than the simple truth that the first and the last freedom is the freedom of the other. Thank you, sir. Oh, good morning, sir. Sir, I have a question in context of Subhash Chandra Bose and Gandhi. The, their relationship was essentially of uh, respect despite discord, right? And what do you think Subhash Chandra Bose's idea was a resentment or anger? And how do we have, how do we understand this kind of a relationship when we talk about democracy and India's even struggle. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's a that's a good question, and I think that that should give us uh, two concrete ways of tying this all up. Um, in the most direct manner possible, to answer your extremely direct and important question, neither Bose nor Ambedkar had resentment towards Gandhi. Right. If we are right in distinguishing anger from resentment, were they angry to your question? Yes, they were, right? Um, they were so angry, at least Bose was so angry that first he had to leave the Congress. As we know, he won the popular in the, in the, the president's election. And then it, the, you know, people said, no, he's too socialist, uh, too far to the left. And so he leaves and then, He's so angry and so committed to liberation by force that he sets up an army, right? The first thing about resentment is it will never take a measure that has courage written anywhere near it, right? That's why I think the, the, the defining act of political resentment is uh, a young man celibate, Gita mouthing goes to a prayer meeting and kills an unarmed aging man. Is that anger? No. Is Godse angry? He writes he's angry, but that's not anger. Angry is what Ambedkar is after Gandhi's epic fast in 19, the, 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 you know, the separate electorates issue. That's what anger looks like. And I want to end because I think you, you bring up a very important question here, which we must address. Uh, it, is, it is of course often said that, you know, that this was an epic fast and they clashed viciously and, you know, they fell apart and Ambedkar kept writing about it and, and so on. Um, this is why I think we have to rethink our democratic vocabulary because we are trapped in seeing our entire political culture or the history of our political thought in terms of hostilities and enmities. This is why I think we need to separate those who were philosophically angry, that is to say their works are animated by moral anger from those who were bearers of political and majoritarian resentment. It is said, for example, um, that Ambedkar was Gandhi's enemy. If Ambedkar was Gandhi's enemy, he was a really bad one. Because if he was an enemy, he could have let Gandhi die during the fast. He did not. He came back from the brink. Both did. Gandhi lived on. And it's not that Ambedkar renounced everything and went away for some tapasya, which he hated. The idea of ritual sacrifice repelled Ambedkar. But they both came back. 
into politics. Ambedkar uh, dedicates the next 15 years to writing some of the most sustained monographs on the most complex questions of his time. Right? That is, that is the anger, but it is also something else. It is the ability, and this is what I will call the aporia of uh, the real truth and aporia, both at one and the same time, of Dalit thought. That it knows how to forgive. Ambedkar walked during Gandhi's funeral procession in January 48. There are photos of him standing there in the procession. The aporia that we do not understand about Dalit thought is that it knows how to forgive, but it cannot afford to forget. Ambedkar could not afford, it's not that he decided to or was unable to, he simply could not afford to forget that fast until death that Gandhi took. Did he forgive? Of course he did. The man was uh, the, the chairman of the drafting committee that wrote the world's longest national constitution. But the aporia of Dalit thought is that while it knows forgiveness, while the ethics of forgiveness is at the heart of Dalit thought, what it cannot accept is the politics of amnesia, a politics anchored in forgetfulness. This is why it is on the minority, the figure of the minor, Remember the Buddha and his Dhamma where Ambedkar talks about Siddharth being outnumbered in front of his own generals who want to go to war over water and Siddharth walks away. He just walks away. He was the minor, outnumbered. And the very idea of the minority is that it refuses the majoritarian politics of amnesia. It cannot and it must not forget that there was a mosque where the majority now goes all in all its pomp and splendor, thinking that temple was there forever. The majority thrives in the rhetoric of eternity. because it, its main instrument is amnesia. The minority by its very definition is that which refuses to forget. It refuses to forget and it refuses to forget that refusal has its own form. It can take what you were saying, it can take the form of anger. But because this minority also forgives, again, think of its letter. Because this minority forgives, there is no resentment in it. By its very nature. Okay. And so we should end with that aporia in mind. How to have a democratic politics in which we are willing to forgive, but we shall not forget. Thank you, sir. Uh, that brings us to the end of this very, very enlightening question answer session. And before I hand over the, before I invite uh, Professor Sanjeev Kumar sir for the vote of thanks, uh, a quick announcement for everyone that the Gandhi Study Circle is offering a short term certification course on non violent communication, the details of which are posted in the chat box. And we invite everyone present and to you know, check that out. That being said, it is my genuine pleasure to invite Professor Sanjeev Kumar sir the convener of the Dandi study circle to extend the word of thanks for today's wonderful lecture. So, please. Uh, thank you, Aditya. In fact, uh, uh, it's been more than two hours. Uh, but the fact that there are over 100 people, you know, audience, you know, he, being here, I think. Uh, uh, 
it's such it's so fascinating you know uh, to listen to this conversation and professor kumar uh, i can't thank you enough uh, for doing this you have given us enough fodder uh, to think and reflect uh, uh, no political action uh, as you rightly brought uh, through your discussion uh, seem to enjoy uh, a greater moral authority uh, than uh, the way the non violent methods uh, of gandhi uh, which he inaugurated uh, centuries ago uh, uh, is framework of satyagraha uh, i believe does provide a unique uh, kind of moral, moral political action uh, which of course as you rightly said uh, is based on the idea of moral duty uh, uh, to act uh, without allowing uh, self mastery Uh, to lapse uh, into the kind of anger uh, mm. that manifests today uh, in the brute uh, majoritarian forms uh, that exist today and in the everyday uh, life of you know the world uh, how do we channelize anger and resentment uh, is a crucial question uh, that we gain uh, from the lecture today uh, and truly uh, it's been a treat uh, to listen to uh, professor kumar Uh, uh i also wish to thank our principal uh, professor sangeeta pandita uh, you know who has always been very kind uh, in supporting us uh, in various academic uh, and corporal curricular activities mm. uh, we thank all the distinguished scholars you know colleagues scholars research scholars students uh, who joined us uh, from the university Uh, from different parts of the country and abroad also uh, thank you all uh, for enriching uh, the discussion today uh, uh, a great amount of work is uh, done um, behind the scene uh, the technical team uh, led by dr sonu tribedi uh, and and spirited students uh, members of our gandhi study circle uh, of course deserves a special mention for this i can thank uh, joya sani priyanshu uh, tanmay pumang ankit uh, shrishti and may, many others uh, and of course our faculty staff uh, dr aftab uh, dr shavana dr tripta uh, for their valuable uh, guidance and support uh, i look forward uh, to seeing you all uh, in the next uh, series of lectures uh, that we uh, plan to have uh, in the near future uh before uh, we leave uh, my request may I request you all uh to uh, please open your videos uh, so that we can have a group uh, photograph uh, for memories this is the only way we connect you know with the rest of the world today yeah so, yeah just for that's, a moment that's great Uh, thank you so much uh, uh thank you uh, professor kumar uh, for your very enlightening talk today uh, we look forward uh, to have you uh, in our future engagements uh, thank you all uh, the session concludes now have a great day and of course it's a, it's a late evening uh, professor kumar i know <laughs> it is going to be uh, dinner is almost over now i think it's going to be late you know but it's close to midnight now yeah yeah it's okay. midnight and of course all of you thank you so much thank you it's been a real honor and a and a real real pleasure thank you thank you for for this you know firstly for this remarkable initiative uh, uh extremely timely as we all know but but also for organizing this lecture and um you know given me this remarkable chance to really truly exemplary chance to talk to so many uh so many of our students and thanks to all the colleagues who have taken time out to attend this um and i look forward to continuing this <laughs>